Hey guys, I'm CJ, and of all the tech devices I've covered and computers I've built since starting this channel, I've never been as excited about a new computer as I am about this one. This is the Framework laptop. Framework set out to change the way thin and light laptops were made, maintained, and upgraded without sacrificing style, weight, or durability, and I think they may have achieved their goal. This is the Framework DIY Edition laptop, a completely user serviceable and upgradable, ultra portable mobile PC. I've been using it for a week now, and this is my review. There have been several reviews of this laptop, and in every one, the ability to open it up, install, or remove components, and the overall user friendly serviceability and upgradability has been the focus, and that is why I pre ordered this device. But that's not what I want to focus on today. Maybe tomorrow, but today I want to highlight how this performs as a functional thin and light laptop, both physically and performance wise, and how it fits into my daily productivity workflow and maybe how it can fit into yours. So I'm going to cover the design and functionality of the machine. I'll briefly cover some of the performance numbers, how it compares to other laptops in this class. I'll share what I really like about the laptop and what I think can be improved. Let's do this. Let me begin by saying this is not a sponsored video or requested review. Framework didn't send me this laptop. I purchased it myself. Framework doesn't even know I or this channel exists as far as I know. And that allows me to comment on the purchase process and customer experience. First, I did order this back in May on the day pre-orders went live. So it is a batch one unit. The website is well constructed and configured it and ordering the laptop was painless with just a $100 deposit. I got an immediate email with my order confirmation and invoice, then the long wait until the late July shipping estimate. I did receive updates, including when the laptop arrived to the warehouse and a confirmation ensuring I wanted to pay the $1,100 balance. Now, my shipment was delayed by five or six days. However, the framework team quickly communicated the problem and a solution and did send a message with tracking info when the laptop shipped. Any emails I sent were always answered within 24 hours and I even gave customer service a little test. On the initial order, I only ordered half the expansion cards I wanted. So prior to the laptop shipping, I contacted customer service to have the remaining three expansion cards added to my order. And despite my order already being released for shipment, the customer service team was able to quickly process a new order and I received the additional cards the same day as the laptop. So I have to say, in my experience, Frameworks customer support is probably one of the best I've experienced and that goes a huge way in choosing to do business with them again. As far as what you get with Framework, the Framework laptop comes in three pre-configured models, all sporting 11th gen Intel processors with integrated Iris XE graphics. Simply select your tier from the $999 i5-1135G7 base model up to the $2,000 professional model with the more powerful 1185G7 CPU. For my laptop, I selected the DIY mid-tier i7-1165G7 model and I chose to bring my own memory, storage, and operating system. Using the QR codes in the digital guide they brought me to, set up with the laptop was fairly simple. The only minor problem I had was the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth antenna cables were a bit on the long side, which made manage them a little tricky without popping them off the card. And one of the rubber routing guides was free when I opened the chassis. However, a tiny dab of glue and it was right back in place. I was able to easily install Windows 10 and upgrade to Windows 11 beta with no additional BIOS configurations. One thing I definitely have to give Framework a big thank you for is providing an executable batch file for quickly installing all the required drivers. The design and form factor is right in line with other ultra portable thin and light laptops on the market. And in fact, is only 0.25 millimeters thicker than the completely soldered down 13 inch MacBook Pro. At 1.3 kilograms, it weighs in 100 grams lighter than the MacBook. Must be all that glue Apple uses. And despite not being soldered and glued together, the framework is quite durable and rigid with very little flex across the fully aluminum chassis 
classy. The fit and finish is superb and you'd never know this is a completely modular laptop just by seeing and holding it. The display hinges are perfectly tensioned, allowing you to open the display with one hand while not allowing drift in any position. There is the typical springiness to the ultra thin display. However, there is zero wobble in the hinge. The 60 hertz panel is 13.5 inches diagonal, 2256 pixels wide by 1504 pixels high, which works out to about 201 pixels per inch with a three by two aspect ratio. This is the same size and resolution as the 13.5 inch Surface Laptop 4 and produces an extremely clear and sharp image. Individual pixels aren't visible at any distance and the 400 nits of peak brightness is more than enough in any lighting situation. However, Unlike the Surface's display, the framework display is not touch or pen enabled, which is a pretty common feature for a laptop in this class at this price point. Additionally, there's not much in the way of any glare treatment to the screen, so glare can become an issue in some lighting situations. But the three by two aspect ratio is the perfect ratio for productivity. When I'm working in MS Office or web apps, I have no need for the extra lateral screen space a 16 by nine display offers. I want the three by two's extra vertical real estate. And if I do decide to stream some content, the small black bars on the top and bottom of the screen aren't a big deal and a fair trade-off. The built-in 1080p 60fps camera is a step up from the typical 720p offerings of similar laptops and does have a decent amount of both dynamic range and exposure levels. However, as is the case with most tiny aperture cameras, the picture is pretty noisy even in a well-lit studio setting like this. The built-in microphone is probably one of the weaker points of the laptop as again, in a sound treated studio, you still get a significant amount of reverb and there is little in the way of voice isolation or background noise rejection. It's okay for chatting with friends or family. However, for professional calls, I use a Sarmonic plug and play USB-C lavalier mic for better audio. However, there are physical switches that appear to directly cut the power to the camera and microphone. The keyboard is responsive with just enough travel distance and a good tactile response, yet a silent profile. The keyboard is backlight with three brightness levels and adequately serves its purpose. The trackpad is on par, if not identical, to Windows Precision touchpads on other top-selling ultralights like the Surface Book 4 and Samsung Galaxy Flip 13. In fact, despite just being screwed to a millimeter-thin aluminum sheet, Essentially, there's no more deck flex or mushiness in the input surfaces than the top selling mainstream models, including the MacBook Pro. The fingerprint reader is quick and consistently recognizes my fingerprint, unlocking the laptop without fail. The speakers are also pretty typical of an ultra portable and really aren't a consideration for me, as if I'm say listening to Lo-Fi Girl while I'm working, I'm typically wearing earbuds, but the sound reproduction is good, volume level is adequate without distorting at the higher levels, bass response was okay. The only permanent port on the laptop is the 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. And again, I've just briefly tested this, but it does drive my Sennheiser HD 598s well, delivering good quality sound with no need for an inline amp I typically use on mobile devices. Now let's talk about IO because for me, that was a big selling factor. The framework is equipped with four Thunderbolt 4 IO expansions bays, which you can configure any way you want using these expansion cards. There are currently seven expansion cards and I bought at least one of each. Now I put Thunderbolt 4 in air quotes because technically, Thunderbolt needs to be certified and I believe Framework is still in the process of that certification. So these are USB 4 expansions, but the Type-C ports are on a Thunderbolt enabled motherboard with a Thunderbolt controller and a Thunderbolt enabled CPU have a minimum bandwidth of 40 gigabytes per second, PCIe transfer rates of at least 32 gigabits per second with USB 3.2 and DisplayPoint 1.4 alt modes and supports HBR3, which 
happens to be the exact specs for Thunderbolt 4. So if you wanna plug in your external GPU and get in some AAA gaming, it is capable. I was easily able to drive two additional 4K displays using one HDMI and one DisplayPort adapter. And I also use a USB-C hub, which includes ethernet input, one terabyte of additional NVMe storage, HDMI output, and more. The only issue I've run into with the expansion cards is with the one terabyte storage expansion. Despite using a quality Fizon controller and offering fast transfer speed, it quickly overheats and begins throttling with moderate data transfers. And finally, if Framework doesn't offer the expansion card you're looking for, they provide the resources to build your own, including this 3D printed model of the enclosure, which I printed and I'm gonna try a DIY project to get rid of this issue. The included 4-cell 55 watt hour battery lasted 9.1 hours on a single charge on the balanced power profile, which on average consisted of about 4.8 hours of active work time in Word, Excel, Photoshop, and about 4.3 hours in sleep mode. I noticed about a 1.5% drop per hour in sleep mode with Word and Photoshop open. And the battery took one hour and 48 minutes to fully charge while the laptop was in use. Battery life is one of the trade-offs you make with socketed components like sodium memory, storage, and Wi-Fi. Having low power equivalents like LPDDR4 directly soldered to the main board is significantly more efficient and requires less power, but of course isn't serviceable or upgradable. I had zero issues with connectivity. The Intel Wi-Fi 6 Bluetooth 5.2 module delivered fast, consistent, and unimpeded data. Now for performance. The Intel Tiger Lake with its snappy single core speeds that rivals even the Apple M1 is the perfect choice for this productivity laptop. Now, hear me out because I know a lot of you are hoping for a Ryzen version of this laptop, and I'm not trying to be an Intel fanboy, but let me explain why I don't think Ryzen is a good choice for framework. First, this is a productivity machine. I bought this to be able to untether myself from my desk and still get work done typing scripts in Word, processing benchmarks in Excel, manage my calendar and keeping up with emails in Outlook, outputting PDFs, creating thumbnails in Photoshop, all of that is faster on a Tiger Lake CPU. And thanks to Intel finally stepping up their game in the graphics department with onboard encoders and a 96 EU Iris XE graphics, I even have the capability to do some light video editing and rendering in Resolve and Premiere Pro when I actually get to do some traveling. Now, if you're writing and compiling code, managing local massive databases or like 3D rendering, then you want the extra cores Ryzen provides for those heavy multi-threaded workloads. However, if that is your workload, I'm gonna argue that this isn't the type of laptop you want because even though the low powered U series Ryzen mobile processors are much better at that stuff than this Intel part, they're still restricted in that performance by their lower TDPs. You'd be better off with one of the 45 watt or higher H series Ryzen's like the 5800H, and those come in slightly thicker laptops with better power delivery and cooling. Now, one big advantage of say a Ryzen 7 5700U framework laptop would be cost. Ryzen laptops are cheaper, and it's not because the CPUs are cheaper, it's just that the standards the Intel CPU supports are more expensive. The hardware needed to support the four Thunderbolt 4 ports on this laptop is expensive. With Ryzen, you lose the high-speed bandwidth and expandability, but if you don't need that, there's really no reason to pay for it. Now, I'm not gonna flood the screen with a bunch more benchmarks, Intel versus Ryzen versus the M1. This CPU has been around for like eight months. There are dozens of videos and published articles covering that. Basically, single core speed is king for most common productivity tasks, and Tiger Lake is king of single core speed, at least on the PC side. What I did do is run several benchmarks to make sure this 1165G7 performed as it should in this framework laptop. Now, I have all the benchmarks here for both its power efficient 15 watt TDP, as well as its performance 28 watt TDP, feel free to pause and study, but the bottom line is this CPU performed exactly how it should in this laptop. Now, I know there were a few reviewers that said the CPU was getting really hot, hitting 100 degrees, and it does. 
but that's what it's supposed to do. That's how Intel's 10 nanometer super thin Willow Cove cores work. When you hit the CPU with a big multi-core workload like Cinebench R23, the cores immediately max boost to 4.6, 4.7 gigahertz. Package power draw hits 45 up to 60 watts, depending on ambient temp, and it'll stay there until all four cores warm up and hit 100 degrees. Then all the cores will drop to about 3.2 gigs. Power demand drops and stays at about 28 watts and the CPU temp stays in the mid to lower 80s. Now, it might freak you out to see cores hitting 100 degrees Celsius, but this is normal behavior. It has nothing to do with the cooling solution. Frameworks cooling solution is actually pretty good with a larger fan that's typical for an ultra portable, which actually helps. The bigger the fan, the less annoying the noise it makes is, and while this fan can get noticeably loud, when it ramps up, it's not a high-pitched whiny sound. That covers all the design features and performance, I think. If I forgot something, I'm sure you guys will let me know in the comments. I want to end with the pros, cons, and my concerns about the Framework laptop. I've pretty much covered the pros and some of the cons, so I guess I'll just explain why I went with the Framework laptop over some of the more established competitors and what sacrifices I may have made by doing so. First and foremost, I went with the Framework because of what it is, a fully user serviceable and upgradable ultra portable laptop, but also the three by two display, like I mentioned, it's the perfect aspect ratio for applications I use most on the system, the processor for its single core speed and performance in my workflow, as well as the high speed expandability and configurable ports. It's not only more IO than most thin and lights, but it's configurable and faster. Now, one trade off I made with the framework concept is no low power memory option. LPDDR4 memory is much faster than the SODIMM you can find on the market and gives U-series processors a significant boost, especially in iGPU performance. But LPDDR4 is directly soldered to the motherboard, so... Now, what I didn't get that I would like to have seen first is a touchscreen. Moving from a two-in-one, I'm constantly reaching for the screen to navigate through my documents or spreadsheets only to leave fingerprints, mobile data, or 5G integration. I like to get outside when I can in Colorado and still be connected to the grid while I'm off the grid. I'm not sure if you can build a 5G modem into one of these, but I'd like to see someone smarter than me try. And really, that's it. Framework really did make a great product their first time out the gate, and of course, the kicker all the issues I described and the improvements that I'd like to see are just an upgrade away. Framework can just add a touchscreen to the marketplace or upgraded microphone array or anything they can create the community wants. The only problem with this upgrade path, and it's a big one, it requires Framework to still be around to support this laptop and make the upgrades. Framework itself says it right on their website. Many have tried and failed at the upgradable or user serviceable device. If Framework becomes another casualty, I'm left with a laptop that's just as serviceable and upgradable as an Apple product. As of now, the Framework marketplace doesn't even exist. I really hope Framework stays viable, but they may have slightly missed the mark on their customer base that's in the market for an ultra portable laptop like this. Typically, and this isn't 100% the case, but a high percentage of those customers, A, don't know much about computers, and B, don't have the technical knowledge or mostly desire to take any tech device apart and work on it in any way, shape, or form. They just want a simple device that does what they need it to do with as little fuss as possible. They're the customer that walks into Best Buy and has a blue shirt help them pick out a laptop. If something goes wrong, they can just bring it back to the Geek Squad. Now, Framework does have this customer covered with their pre-configured systems if they can get that marketing to that customer. The customer base that is drawn to this computer and this concept are more like me, I think. PC enthusiasts who are experienced at or at least familiar with configuring and building their own systems. They want a lot of options to be able to build a PC exactly how they want it to support their individual workflow. And at this early stage, Framework isn't there. This is their only product. It's still in pre-order, although they're moving into batch four, good sign, 
but this basically just comes in one flavor with some selectable toppings. Just three Tiger Lake CPUs to choose from and configurable memory storage and expansion card options. And just judging from the framework community forums, many aren't looking for this thin and light laptop. I see a lot of questions about Ryzen, which I've already discussed, and dedicated graphics, which also doesn't really work in this concept. Laptops in this form factor with dedicated graphics like the Acer Swift X, for example, have the GPU soldered directly to the motherboard, just like the CPU. This is done for a lot of reasons, power efficiency, cooling support, and the ability to keep it this thin. With that, upgrading just became significantly more difficult and expensive. You need to replace the GPU, CPU, and motherboard as a unit. Adding a GPU on a daughter board increases height, requires independent cooling, so a second fan, and significantly increases power demand, so probably a bigger battery. Now, you're past the ultralight form factor into something like an HP Omen laptop. Now, I think Framework may get there. This is their proof of concept, which is a great product, and happened to be exactly what I was looking for. If it's something you're looking for, the framework link is in the description below. Be sure to like and subscribe while you're down there and leave a comment. Let me know what you think of the framework. I hope to see you in the next one. Until then, stay safe.